بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is indeed an honor to appear before the International Court of Justice on behalf of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Enjoying a long-standing principled position in support of the full realization of the inherent right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, the Islamic Republic of Iran follows these advisory proceedings of the court with great interest. What makes this proceeding even more prominent and focused of attention of almost every nation in the world is its concurrence with the ongoing appalling situation in Palestine, particularly the Gaza Strip. To indicate how severe and grave the situation in Gaza is, I merely refer to three United Nations and World Health Organization report. First, according to the UN Secretary General, as a result of Israeli military operation, the entire population is enduring destruction at a scale and speed without parallel in recent history, and 2.2 million Palestinians there struggling to simply make it through another day without proper shelter, heating, sanitary facilities, food and drinking water. Second, according to the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and I quote, for children in particular, there is no food, no water, no school, nothing but the terrifying sons of war, day in and day out, and its people are witnessing daily threat to their very existence while the world washes on. End of quote. Third, according to the WHO, the population in Gaza is facing extreme hunger with insufficient food and high level of malnutrition. Yet, the conditions in Gaza are becoming much worse every day. We remain at a turning point in the history of mankind. The opinion of this court can set the ground for saving lives of thousands of innocent women and children and contribute to the legitimate demand of the people deprived of its inherent right to self-determination for decades. It is hoped that this court will once more make history by giving a landmark advisory opinion in support of the right to self-determination of Palestinian people, which may finally help seize the illegal prolonged occupation of Palestine. Mr. President, members of the court, in our oral, oral statement, we submit that, firstly, this court has jurisdiction to give advisory opinion requested. Secondly, there are legal consequences arising from the prolonged occupation of Palestinian territories by Israeli occupying regime in violation of the right of Palestinian people who have never experienced the right to self-determination. And thirdly, Having elaborated on the legal consequences that arise for all states and the United Nations from this status, I will reiterate the inclusive plan previously submitted by the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations for realization of the right of Palestinians to self-determination. Mr. President, first we submit that the court has jurisdiction to render the advisory opinion requested by the General Assembly in Resolution 77-247 of 30 December 2022. Here we believe that the elements of Article 65-1 of the Statute of the Court, namely the existence of the legal question and the authorized body, it means General Assembly, are fulfilled in this case. That said, the ICJ, as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, can assist the General Assembly to exercise its functions under the UN Charter by rendering the advisory opinion requested. Therefore, just as the court has established its jurisdiction in the advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory, it has jurisdiction in the present case based on the same grounds. Moreover, there is no compelling reason for declining to give an advisory opinion. Mr. President, 
Now I turn to the first section of our reasoning regarding the merits of the matter. Here we first argue that the Israeli occupying regime has violated and continues to violate on several grounds the Palestinians' right to self-determination. The legal status of the right to self-determination is generally understood to be attributed to peoples and granted first in the UN Charter in several UN General Assembly resolutions and its inclusion in common Article 1 of the two International Covenant of Human Rights. As such, and I quote, all peoples have the right freely to determine without external interference their political status and their place in the international community and to pursue their economic, social, and cultural development, and every state has the duty to respect this right in accordance with the provisions of the Charter." End of quote. In line with the elements mentioned in the question raised for the request of the advisory opinion in the General Assembly Resolution, I briefly present my arguments on a series of measures that contribute, that constitute the ongoing violation by Israeli occupying regime, these are as follows. One, prolonged occupation. Two, altering demographic composition in the occupied territories. Three, altering the character and the status of the holy city of Al-Ghuz. Four, discriminatory measures. And five, violation of the right of Palestinian people to permanent sovereignty over their natural resources. First and foremost, the prolonged occupation by Israeli occupying regime confirms its intention to make it permanent in violation of the principle of prohibition of acquisition of the territory by force. The occupation of Palestinian territories is the longest military occupation existing today. The right to self-determination of Palestinian people continues to be violated as long as this occupation ages. This ongoing violation towards Palestinians' ability to rely on a state-based rights and obligation under international law, depriving them of their inalienable right to self-determination, including the right to live in freedom, justice, and dignity. Thus, we request the court to consider the very fact of prolongation of the occupation as an indicator of the violation of the right of Palestinians to self-determination. Mr. So, President, apart from prolonged occupation altering the demographic composition in the occupied territories has led to violation of Palestinians' right to self-determination. The UN Security Council has a bulk of resolution concerning the occupation of Palestinian territories, all condemning, among others, altering the demographic composition of these territories by the Israeli occupying power. Hence, it is a well-established fact that the Israeli occupying regime has grossly violated international law on an ongoing basis. Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention reads, and I quote, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies, end of quote. Apart from that, the court in its opinion in the Wall case declared that, and I quote, the provisions for IBs not only deportation or forced transfers of population, such as those carried out during the Second World War, but also any measures taken by an occupying power in order to organize or encourage transfers of parts of its own population in the occupied territory, end of quote. Furthermore, the court affirmed in the same case the violation of the right to self-determination based on measures taken by occupying power which has led to a change in the demographic composition of Palestine. Mr. President, members of the court, for civil deportation of civilian populations widely known for one of its most infamous stances as Nechba Day has a long history. Essentially, with the illegal formation of 
Israeli occupying regime in 1948 instead of former British Mandate of Palestine, the demographic composition changed significantly with the displacement of more than 700,000 Palestinians. In fact, the Israeli occupying regime was illegally established that year through a violent, arbitrary process and involved the deportation or forcible transfer of hundreds of thousands of native Palestinians from their land to create a majority Jewish colony in line with the demand of the Zionist movement. By denying the right to return of forcibly deported Palestinians to Palestine, the Israeli regime continues to deprive those Palestinians of their right to live in their homeland. The majority of Palestinians live outside Palestine, namely in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, with many of them remaining stateless, living in crowded refugee camps that lack basic infrastructure. Needless to say, forcible displacement of civilian population is of such a high significance that has been defined as a war crime under Article 8 of the Statute of the International Criminal Court. Mr. President, the next measure that has violated the right of self-determination of Palestinians is altering the character and the status of the holy city of Al-Quds. The action taken by Israeli occupying regime with regard to the holy city of Al-Quds have utterly disregarded the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. Altering the character and the status of Al-Quds has had significant religious and cultural implications for Palestinian people. al Ghos al-Sharif has a remarkable religious and historical significance for Palestinians as well as Muslims, Christians, and Jews worldwide. By altering the status quo of the city and its holy site, the reoccupying regime has undermined the cultural heritage and identity of the Palestinian people and has further violated their right to self-determination. The construction and expansion of the settlements along with the violation of Palestinians' right to free movement and revocation of residency permits have altered the demographic and cultural character of the city as well. Mr. President, members of the court, the next series of measures depriving the Palestinian people of their right to self-determination comprise of discriminatory measures targeting the basic rights of the people in the occupied territories. This has been underlined by the UN General Assembly and recorded extensively to include the killing and injury of civilians, the forced displacement of civilians, and a systematic policy of obstruction of humanitarian assistance. The Israeli occupying action, as manifested in various laws and policies, have created a system of discrimination that has negatively affected the Palestinian population. In Palestine, the occupying regime's expansionism has consolidated into apartheid through the longest occupation in modern history. It is well established that apartheid is a crime against conscience and dignity of mankind and is further in violation of fundamental principles of international law enshrined in the UN Charter and crystallized in the international human rights law and seriously threatens international peace and security. The Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Palestine has concluded that the political system of entrenched rule in occupied Palestine, which endows one racial national ethnic group with substantial rights, benefits, and privileges, while intentionally subjecting another group to leave behind walls and checkpoints under a permanent military rule, satisfies the prevailing evidentiary standard for ex the existence of apartheid. Many laws, policies, and practices and implemented since 19, 
48 by Israeli occupying regime have been aimed at fragmenting the Palestinian people and dividing them into various groups. This clearly denies the Palestinian people its right to self-determination. In tandem with the above, construction and expansion of the settlements, segregated roads, barriers, and checkpoints has created a system of apartheid, effectively isolating Palestinian communities, which manifestly violates multiple provisions of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The Court is therefore requested to opine so that such policies and practices must be seized immediately as they continue to violate the right of self-determination of Palestinian people. Mr. President, members of the Court, the right to exercise permanent sovereignty over natural resources is inevitable component of the right to self-determination. The two international covenants of human rights and a number of UN General Assembly resolutions recognize this right. The UN General Assembly has expressed grave concern over a range of practices by Israeli occupying regime, negatively impacting Palestinians' natural resources. It has been affirmed the right of Palestinian people to permanent sovereignty over their national wealth and resources as an integral component of the right to self-determination. It has been further confirmed that the right should be used in the interest of their national development, the well-being of the Palestinian people, and as part of their right to self-determination. Yet Palestinians do not enjoy their own natural resources, which include land, fresh water, and mineral resources. Imposing restrictions by the Israeli regime on access of Palestinians to water resources, groundwater, and hydrocarbon deposits are all instances of flagrant violation of the right to self-determination. Mr. President, members of the court, this court has in several cases, in particular in Wall case, identified the obligation to respect the right of self-determination have an ergo omnes character as one of the essential principles of contemporary international law. As a general rule, where ergo, ergo omnes obligations of international law are breached, third states have mainly three obligations. Firstly, non-assistance, secondly, non-recognition, and lastly, cooperation to bring to an end such violation. In this context, an interested or third state in accordance with the jurisprudence of the ICJ could be defined as one which is not directly affected or injured by an internationally wrongful act and which has yet a legal interest in the protection and compliance of the rights by the very reason of importance of the rights involved and this very nature makes them the concern of all states. As regard the primary obligations of the third state toward prolonged occupation of Palestine, the three obligations mentioned above remained relevant in, accord in accordance with the paragraph 146 of the 2004 ICJ advisory opinion in the Wall case. In addition to the jurisprudence of ICJ, the primary triple obligations of third states towards serious breaches of ergo omnes obligations find support in the practice of other UN United Nations organs as well. In its resolution 2334, the UN Security Council unequivocally reiterated the importance of states abstaining from recognizing occupying powers internationally wrongful acts. The International Law Commission in draft article 411 of its 2001 draft articles on responsibility of a state for internationally wrongful acts, along with underlying the duty of a state to not recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious breach of ergo omnes rules and not to render the aid or assistance in maintaining this, that situation, emphasized 
the duty of all states to cooperate through lawful means in a joint and coordinated effort to counteract the effects of these breaches. Mr. President, in light of above mentioned, the Court is requested to remind all states of their obligations under international law of the following. First, not to aid or assist directly or indirectly the Israeli occupying regime, enabling it to continue its prolonged occupation of Palestine and or any of its continued policies and practices that violate the right to self-determination of Palestinian people. This may include, in particular, avoiding any kind of political, military, economic, or other cooperation with the Israeli regime, enabling it to continue such violations. Second, not to recognize the illegal situation resulting from prolonged occupation by the Israeli occupying regime of Palestinian territory and or any of its continued measures that violate the right to self-determination of Palestinian people, and third, to cooperate effectively with one another in all relevant fields and forums to bring to an end any impediment resulting from the ongoing violation by the Israeli occupying regime of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, including from its prolonged occupation and any of its measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the holy city of Al-Quds, obviously such cooperation is of utmost urgency and importance given the ongoing situation in Gaza Street, where, according to one estimate, Israeli's military is killing Palestinians at an average rate of 250 people a day, which exceeds the daily death toll of any other major conflict of recent years. In this context, I recall this Honorable Court's important order of 26 January 2024 on the request by South Africa for indication of provisional measures. The order concerns application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, and as such, all states, in particular those providing support to Israel, are legally under the duty to prevent genocide, particularly by ceasing to provide any aid to the genocider. They are under a duty to punish perpetrators of the crime of genocide. Given the current extremely tragic conditions in Gaza Strip, the court is respectfully requested to once again call on the occupying regime to fully comply with the order. Evidently, in practical terms, even the partial compliance of the Israeli regime with only subparagraph 1 of paragraph 86 of that order is possible only through complete termination of all its military operations in the Gaza Strip. Mr. President, I would like to recall the primary responsibility of the Security Council for the maintenance of international peace and security under Article 24 of the UN Charter. I submit that the inaction or insufficient action of the Security Council, if not the main, is one of the main causes of prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territories. All the atrocities and crimes committed by the Israeli regime in the past almost 80 years are a consequence of such inaction. Even today, the Security Council is paralyzed due to the stalemate caused by a certain permanent member. Other relevant United Nations bodies have also responsibility to monitor and document human rights violations and to facilitate bringing the perpetrators to justice. This fact alone underscores how essential it is for the court to remind the Security Council of its charter-based obligation. It must also be made clear that such an obligation cannot be fulfilled by convening meetings or issuing certain important procedural resolutions. Rather, it needs conclusive decisions 
under Chapter 7 of the United, Charter, United Nations Charter and a follow-up mechanism to ensure its full and prompt implementation by Israeli regime. Mr. President, as our Supreme Leader said, the calamity of Gaza is the calamity of humanity and international community as a whole. Therefore, each and every state and relevant international organization has its own legal and moral responsibility to act urgently and decisively to prevent the ongoing crimes of Israeli regime in Gaza Strip. Definitely, as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, this court has an important role to play. Now the world nations expect the court to render its advisory opinion in a manner that effectively and practically consolidate the rule of law to the determinant of the rule of power and to bring hope to Palestinians that justice will ultimately prevail. We should not leave them alone and let them down in days that they need the support and assistance of humanity the most. This is a collective legal and moral responsibility and we must fulfill it responsibly. Finally, Mr. President, I must stress that our participation in this hearing and the content of our statement here is without prejudice to the long-standing position of the Islamic Republic of Iran regarding the question of Palestine. In view of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the only legal, practical, democratic, and just method to effectively realize the inherent right to self-determination of the Palestinian people is to hold a national referendum in the Palestine. The details of this plan are contained in an official document of the United Nations issued in 2019. Lastly, this statement shall in no way imply or recognition of Israel. I thank you, Mr. President.